All right, uh, tonight we're going to read in Colossians 1, and we're going to start from verse 19. And he says, uh, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, uh, you may remember that we've been in the midst of a series of, of classes where we've been you know, uh, talking about fullness being a principal theme in, in uh, Paul's epistles. In fact, I think that uh, the, the recent disc that we sent out was uh, kind of an overview. And so tonight we're going to talk about the things that are referred to in verse 24 uh, and the, about Paul having said that, uh, that he's filled up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. He said in his flesh for his body's sake. We're going to talk about Paul filling up the sufferings of Christ. And uh, I've got something here that y y y all know that a lot of times I'll use uh, an interlinear uh, testament. In other words, uh, 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 all this is is that generally you have the textus receptus in Greek, and then you'll have the word-by-word -word translation of that word in English. And of course, you, the, the translators couldn't take that and print that out like a Bible because gr Greek syntax is not the same. It wouldn't, in order for it to make sense to us in English, sometimes certain words had to be set before others and whatnot. But a lot of times it's useful to, to look at that, to get uh, just a different perspective about perhaps some meaning of words in a certain verse. And I want, to, I want you to follow along as this is read out of verse 24. And it says that, uh, in reference to Paul, he says, Now I am rejoicing in the sufferings of me for the sake of you, and I am filling up the deficiencies of the afflictions of the Christ in the flesh of me for the sake of the body, and so forth. In other words, he, he refers to, he says, I am filling up. In other words, that's the, the, literally what he's saying. In other words, it, the, in verse 24, he, he says that in, in our King James Bible, he says, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and the I am is not in there. You know, in other words, they just say, and, and fill up that which is behind. But I think this is instructive to think about it this way because of, I believe that he's got us, uh, 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 when he says, I am filling up, I believe he's referring to something that is specifically happening to him at that moment. I mean, it, it has, it's, it's relating to the, something he's experiencing as he's writing this. And of course, it has to do with his imprisonment. This is a prison epistle, and I believe that it's, it's, the verse is an, an, an attempt of, of the apostle to explain his purpose in what he's doing, that his purpose in, in enduring imprisonment and affliction, as he's saying, because I am filling up the sufferings of Christ, that which is behind, he said, of the sufferings of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. And these things are, are very important to us. They're much more important, I think, than 
a lot of preachers and teachers want to recognize even those who accept the Pauline doctrine and the grace message and, and whatever. Uh, now look at Philippians 1 about these, these things, about these, this imprisonment. Go to Philippians 1, and I, while you're turning, you can go ahead and get a, Ephesians chapter 3. You'll be two or three pages apart there, not any big deal. But in Ephesians 1, and then we'll look at Ephesians, I mean Philippians 1, and then we'll look at Ephesians 3. And uh, in Philippians 1, uh, the Philippian people, uh, they, are, they believe through Paul's ministry in the book of Acts. And so he's, he's not really suffering in the same sense for them as he is for some others. And he's, again, he's explaining some of these things. So Philippians 1 in verse 8, he says, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent. And in a, in a matter of speaking, he's suffering for something that's more excellent than what's been known before. That you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. But I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So he's saying, uh, talking about his bonds, his, his imprisonment here, and he said, I want you to understand that these things have happened out. They're turning rather to the furtherance of the gospel. Is that I'm not basically saying I'm not sad about these things. I'm willing to accept them. Uh, and of course, he refers to them in the Ephesian letter in chapter 3. Go to Ephesians 3. And so he says here from verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, -ward. Well, he's referring to a specific type of Gentile then. He doesn't say, I'm, I'm a, the prisoner for the Gentiles. He says, I'm the prisoner for you Gentiles. And he uh, clarifies that in, the, in chapter 2. Look at Ephesians 2. And he says there from verse 11. Ephesians 2 verse 11 he says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time, the time past, would include the time of the book of Acts, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So when he says that, uh, like he said in the Colossian letter, he talked about the dispensation of God which is given, he said to me for you. And he said, I'm, I'm filling up the sufferings of Jesus Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. I'm the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, you who in time past were without hope, you're aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and so forth, you see. So the, the idea about him filling up the sufferings of Christ has it, Gentiles like us in view, you see. Uh, it's like uh, even though Christ had died for all, 
when he, when he died at Calvary, when he suffered and died at Calvary, even though God gave him to be a ransom for all, it was not known that he had been given a ransom for all. Uh, certainly not immediately. The twelve preached the resurrection in the book of Acts, but they didn't know why Christ had died. And so when the Lord appears to Saul on the road to Damascus and saves him as a result of these things, Paul receives a revelation that the, the Christ that Jesus of Nazareth that rose from the dead had justified some people, Jews and Greeks, he said in Romans chapter 1. So it began to be made known that he had suffered for, you know, some people who were nigh, Jews and Greeks. But the fact that he had died for them that were afar off and people like us and the Ephesians and the Colossians, that was not being made known. So even though Christ had suffered for us, it's like that without you hearing about it and without Paul's suffering so that you could know about it, the sufferings of Christ would have been somewhat in vain because even though he had suffered for you, if you don't know about it, then you see, that's what filled up the sufferings of Christ, the fact that Paul was willing to do this. And as I said, these, these things are, are, are very significant for us. Now, I want you to go back. We're going to kind of step back just a little bit and look at some things. I want you to go to Hebrews. Go to Hebrews 2 and get Acts chapter 3. Hebrews 2 and Acts chapter 3. And in Hebrews 2, read with me from, uh, well, let's start in verse 6. Hebrews 2 verse 6. And he's quoting out of the Psalms, and it says, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor, and it set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Well, see, the captain of their salvation, that's the reference to Christ, to, to, to Jesus. That is, that he became perfect through sufferings. While you're back here, as, you know, it's like in case we missed it, he said it again, look in chapter 5. In Hebrews 5, he says from verse 5, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, Christ, not Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. The, the reason I'm reading these passages out of the book of Hebrews this way is to point out the fact that once Jesus Christ had suffered and died by, uh, in, in obedience to the will of the Father, and now that God has perfected him, he's perfect in resurrection, you see. He's not perfect 
without his sufferings. Uh, and that's a hard thing for people to really get, you know, handle on exactly. He, even though he's born without sin, and he's the son of man, he's the perfect man. No, no, no man ever more perfect than he ever walked upon the face of the earth in terms of, you know, sinlessness. And yet, <laughs> according to the truth of the passages, he's perfected in his resurrection through sufferings. Well then, after he rises from the dead, then for, the Holy Ghost has to appoint someone else, some other people, to preach that resurrection because he himself can't preach it because the people who are going to preach it are going to suffer. And he can't suffer anymore. He's, perf he's, he's perfected in sufferings and therefore the Holy Ghost, uh, as it were, appointed men to preach that resurrection who themselves would be capable of sufferings in, making, in preaching this. And now look in Acts, in Acts chapter 3, uh, Peter's the preacher here in verse 14. Acts 3 verse 14, he's condemning the, the people of Israel for having rejected him. Uh, I'll tell you, let's read from verse 13. He says, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified His Son Jesus, whom ye delivered up. And denied Him in the presence of Pilate when He was determined to let Him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murder to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And His name, through faith in His name, hath made this man strong, the man they healed there, whom ye see and know, Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Well, see, they, they knew that Christ should, that it was appointed unto the Christ to suffer. The Old Testament prophet prophesied of his sufferings. And now they are preaching His resurrection and are going to be partakers of those sufferings. But look at chapter 5. In Acts 5, verse 41, it says, And they, the twelve, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. And daily in the temple, in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Well, for the most part, Paul's sufferings after, the, after he's converted on the road to Damascus, after the Lord appears unto him, Paul's sufferings really are not any different from these that the twelve suffer in the respect that they are uh, they're preaching the resurrection. Uh, and of course, Paul is one of the persecutors of them up to, up to, up to his conversion, uh, except for one thing. And I want you to turn to, uh, to 1 Corinthians 9. Go to 1 Corinthians 9 and take Isaiah 53. First Corinthians nine and Isaiah fifty three. Now in First Corinthians nine, he says from verse eleven. First Corinthians nine verse eleven. He says, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Well, you see, not only was Paul suffering in making known that God had raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead, as the twelve were. The twelve said they praised God that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. In other words, they were all suffering in that respect. And, and they are, if you 
please, partakers of Christ's sufferings. And, and you know, in preaching the resurrection. In preaching His resurrection, they're becoming a partaker of His sufferings. And yet Paul's uh, added to that, though, the fact that pa Paul has given a revelation about these sufferings that in it, in those sufferings, that he had justified some people. Now, the twelve didn't know that. In other words, Paul, when he, like in Acts 13, when he, when he preached there, he said that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things. From, and that really, that brought a lot of persecution upon Paul during the book of Acts among the Jews who basically worship Moses, you know, and their, their own religious system that was based upon following Moses, which they didn't because the Lord condemned them about it. He said, if you, if you really believe Moses, you'd have believed me because he wrote of me, and on and on. But see, when Paul preached that God had justified them, and, which is what the gospel of Christ is all about, so... Uh, and and these, this justification, though, look, look in Isaiah 53, and I, I, I'm doing the best I can here. I realize that some of the things are a little bit hard to follow, but we'll have to trust the Lord that maybe He'll help us out as we go along. In, uh, in Isaiah 53, let's read here from verse 10. We're here reading out of the Old Testament prophet, Isaiah 53, verse 10. He says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and of course, the one that's in the passage is Christ, you see, long before he ever was born. Verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, you notice the many? Now, we realized through some things that came later that he made this justification available unto all, but according to the Old Testament, it was many. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So in the book of Acts, Paul would use this passage to show the Jews and the Greeks that their justification was according to the Old Testament Scripture. See? The fact that Christ... And this is an important thing to, to pick up on in this passage. Do you see? Poured out His soul. You, to, you know, you have to just sit down and think about that. The, you ever thought about, I mean, your own soul? That's the seat of your emotion and your, your, your very being, you know. What the things you care about the most deeply and love and... And all of those things are connected there in your soul. And you read this thing here where the Lord poured out His soul unto death in order that He might justify some people. So these are the things that, as, as Paul is suffering in the book of Acts, he's a partaker of Christ's sufferings. Preaching the resurrection, preaching that he, in, by, in this resurrection he had justified many, yet Christ had poured out his soul unto death for some of these people, or for these people that he's preaching to. But there's, there's something that's different. It's like that, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry, I really don't know, I, I guess I'll just have to just see what I can do here. Let me put our little chart like we normally do. And we've got Matthew through John and having to do with Christ's ministry, uh, walking among the people of Israel. I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, healing, performing miracles, the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. And then they say, well, we have no king but Caesar. Crucify this man. And so God raised him from the dead. And then the... 
He ascends up into a cloud. The twelve see him as he ascends up out of their sight. He sheds forth the Holy Ghost. Then the twelve begin to preach the resurrection and suffer for that sake. Here Later on, he appears unto Saul, brighter than the noonday sun. Saul gets saved, and Saul begins to preach the resurrection, and also, though, that he had justified the people. So there's a... Well, I'm going to go out here like I'm going to let that represent the end of the book of Acts just for... So in here, then, there are several apostles. There, there are any number of believers in there who are suffering. They're partakers of Christ's sufferings. They're, they're endeavoring to preach the resurrection unto the God's people and the people that are associated with them. But not one of them was given the grace to suffer for you to make you know it except Paul. John suffered. Didn't suffer for you. Peter suffered. The sufferings he endured, you were not involved. You, had, you couldn't partake in, those, in anything that he had to present because you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers from the covenants of promise. You were without hope and without God in the world. And except that God gave one man the grace to suffer that you might know about it, you wouldn't know about it today. There's something that's different about all this. When Paul said, I am filling up the sufferings of Christ in my flesh for His body's sake, which is the church. I mean, here's somebody that knew what his place was in time and what his job was. God help us to get the picture in our own life about that kind of thing. What, what are you here for? I mean, I, there's something about that that appeals to me. I mean, it's like that... <laughs> We just kind of flounder around through life, you know, and just going through the motions. And, you know, uh, the song says, they say it's a living, we all got to eat, you know. And yet, we, we lose that sense of, of purpose. What am I here for? And I, I, it's, there's something about that that's, gosh, I mean, it's just, that appeals to me somehow. I mean, to just no. I mean, Paul knew it, and it enabled him to suffer. He, it's like he said, I can go through it. Whatever it is, I can go through it because I know, I know what I'm doing. I, I'm filling up the sufferings of Christ in my flesh. Well, then you see there came a change, though, at the, by the end of the book of Acts. Look in, go to Acts uh, 20. Take uh, Acts 20 and get Philippians chapter 2. One of these days we'll probably have a class or two just on the book of Philippians because the, it, the, these, it's all about, it's just saturated with some things that are along this line. In fact, you see, let me do it like this. I'll put this... I'm going to put this off in a bracket, and then we've got the rapture here. And uh, then we'll say there's the tribulation out here, and then the, the second coming of Christ. Uh, and we'll fill in some of the space here in just a second. In Acts 20, there comes, uh, here we're coming to the end of the book of Acts, and Paul knows that there's uh, something the Lord has shown him that he's going to have to testify unto, and it's going to bring... Uh, sufferings. And of course, as I say, he's, he's already... I mean, you ought to read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in light of all these things. He talks about... He said, a night in the day I've been in the, uh, the deep. He was shipwrecked. And he talks about all the times he'd been... received stripes. What is it? 40 minus 1? They couldn't whip him 40 times, so they whip him 39. He, he was whipped... He'd been in jail, I mean, all stoned, all those things during the book of Acts. But he knows there's something coming up that's, that's going to be worse. In Acts 20, he says in verse 17, he says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church, 
And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, uh, and of course that's the territory of Turkey, what we know of as Turkey today, uh, Asia Minor it's called in the Bible. You know from the first day that I came into Asia after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God." And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more, and so forth. So even though he's suffered, up, you know, he knows that. He said, I'm going up to Jerusalem, and I don't know what's going to befall me there, except that the Holy Ghost witnesses that bonds and affliction abide me, but none of these things move me. I know that I've got to go and testify to this truth. Well, and so he did come to chapter 22. In Acts 22, he talking, talks about a time later that he was in Jerusalem after that the, long after the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And he says in verse 17, Acts 22, verse 17, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance, and saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of the, thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And they gave him audience unto this word and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live and so forth. And from that point then you see he became the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. That's what he's referring to when he wrote in Colossians, I am filling up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ for his body's sake which is the church. In other words, this dispensation of the grace of God in there which is given for you. You see without these sufferings, here's all of these members of the church that Christ had suffered for, but if they don't get to hear it, you see, then there's the body of Christ is going to be missing members. It's, the, it's not going to be a full body. It's not going to be a completed body, but it's going to take special grace, you see, for that person that God sends to these people because he's going to suffer not only from the people he goes to, he's going to suffer from the ones that are supposed to be believers. And that's one of the things that is amazing. I mean, there's an indication that some of the people that Paul preached to in the book of Acts who received him happily and, and counted him a brother and uh, on and on, that when he let it may, be made known that God wanted him to go to those people, he, we, Paul, we've been willing to go with, along with you up to this point, but you're on your own now. I, we can't we can't, uh, we can't go uh, along with this. You, uh, you surely can't mean that God will save people like that. Or that do that? You mean God will save people that do that? Well, they've got to change. Or they got... Doesn't that the way it goes? Well, if I see their life change, then I think, well, then I'll believe it. It's so funny, you know, that people that are liars and, and, and gossips and, and jealous and all that... You know, they can trust the Lord, and they say, praise God, I'm saved, and that, you know, they're still jealous, and they're still gossips and whatever, and they think they're still saved, and they are, you know? I mean, as far as I know, <laughs> I mean, if, the, if God saved them, then they're saved. But why is it they say, well, you know, there's that guy that, does, oh, you know, he's living with him. <laughs> Saw him over there. 
And he said, it, he said he believed in Christ, that he died for his sin, but he ain't changed. I don't believe it. You know. Well, it's, all that's just outward in the flesh, you know. And the message is that I'm crucified with Christ. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And other people don't have any idea what that really means. Serving sin, you know. Oh, I'm still a sinner, so I've got to go do this. To, I've got to confess it. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. Justified, you know. I'm justified through the faith of Christ. Well, if you're justified, you're justified. Look at, look at Philippians chapter 2. And back here in this same epistle where we were reading where he was talking about his uh, this bonds being unto the furtherance of the gospel. And he says in verse 12, Philippians 2 verse 12, he says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. And he's talking about Israel. Among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all, for the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Now I want to talk about that word offered, but let me put something on the board here. There's, some, You know, there's the Ephesians over here, who we've talked about, we saw there that they were in time past, uh, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise. And he talked about the Colossians. You know, we, re we began the class that in time past they were alienated and enemies in their mind by wicked works and what. He said, yet now have they reconciled. And yet in between those two, in other words, we're just like those people there. If there's... Uh, epistles to a certain, uh, any group of people that are like us, that's them right there. But in between there, here's Philippians. I mean, you have these three prison epistles right in there together in the King James Bible, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And yet, I portray it that way because it's... Uh, you see, the Philippians are not like the Ephesians and the Colossians. They were saved back here during the book of Acts. They were somewhat like Paul in the sense that they were Israelites too. That's why he talks about the, the crooked and perverse nation. He says we are the circumcision in chapter 3. And he's not talking about just in the spiritual sense. And he goes on in chapter 3 and he talks about all the things that he could have bragged about as a Jew. But I count them all but done. That I may win, in other words, in order for that unity to be in the body by the cross, there were those th certain things that those people who were saved in the beginning would have to. And there's a, a, a lesson in all of that for us. I mean, anything that tends to cause us to boast and brag and be exalted in the flesh, like the membership in the religious system of this world. Uh, the, all of the accolades that come from the societies and, and, and whatever. I mean, it's great for people to recognize you for your labor, you know, for your work. That, that's fine. But, you know, the, in John chapter 5, the, the Lord said to some people, How can you believe which receive honor one from another and don't seek that honor that cometh from the Father? And so, in other words, what do people in this world do? Well, they, you know, they, they, they're lifted up in, in themselves because... And I'm talking about Christians, so-called Christian people, because they're fundamentalist, And they're from a good family. And they're members of the church. And they've been baptized. And they never do this and they never do that. But they wouldn't 
humble themselves to the degree that they would serve somebody who they saw of as being beneath them. They wouldn't make an effort to connect with that person enough so that they could share the truth with them and get down on their level where they're at. They can't see themselves down there that way, even though that's where they are, you see. And that's why, I mean, it's like if you read the Philippian letter, bingo, the cross is right there in the middle of it. Look back, look, while you're here in chapter 2, look at it, what he says in chapter uh, 2, 2, verse 5. Philippians 2, verse 5, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. I mean, it's like you think you got something to boast in. Verse 6, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So no wonder he refers to be followers of me and, and, and to these people. You know, all the things that I could boast in, count them but dung that there might be this unity and bring the body together. These people who were, you know, had nothing to boast in or brag about pertaining to anything, the, the Jews and whatever, you know. So he says, talks about being offered there in verse 17. And I want you to go to uh, Numbers. Go to Numbers 28. Numbers 28 and take Ephesians chapter 5. Now, Numbers 28, uh, we're going to read from verse 1. And let me mention to you before you read that that word, of course, in uh, Philippians, Philippians 2, where he says, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, is the same word that he uses before he dies in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And he says, Yea, I'm, he said, I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. And it has the, it means to, to pour out like an oblation. In other words, have, in, this is what we're going to read about in Numbers 28. In Numbers 28 verse 1, he said, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel and say unto them, My offering and my bread for my sacrifices made by fire for a sweet savor unto me shall ye observe to offer unto me in their due season. And thou shalt say unto them, This is the offering made by fire which ye shall offer unto the Lord, two lambs of the first year without spot day by day for a continual burnt offering. The one lamb shalt thou offer in the morning and the other lamb shalt thou offer at even. And a tenth part of an ephah of flour for a meat offering mingled with the fourth part of an in of beaten oil. It is a continual burnt offering which was ordained in Mount Sinai for a sweet savor, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord. And the drink offering thereof shall be the fourth part of an hen for the one lamb. In the holy place shalt thou cause the strong wine to be poured unto the Lord for a drink offering. And the other lamb shalt thou offer it even, as the meat offering of the morning, and as the drink offering thereof, thou shalt offer it, a sacrifice made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. So then there's every offering, this is re reference to the continual offering, which is day by day, but every offering that was offered for us in, in, there was offered with a meat, which, you know, flour, and a drink offering right along with it. In other words, the sacrifice would not be complete. It wouldn't be a finished, complete sacrifice without those things accompanying. In other words, the drink offering must accompany it for it to be a complete offering. Well, look in Ephesians 5. And so verse 1, Ephesians 5 verse 1 he says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, 
and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Well, see, there's the offering. Christ himself is the, is the, 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 the lamb offering, the meat offering. He, that's, there's, the, there's Christ himself. So when Paul is referring to being offered, being poured out, just like the Lord said, they said of the Lord in Isaiah 53, that he poured out his soul unto death, that is, it, that he might justify by that death. So Paul was poured out like the drink offering that completed. So therefore he said, I am filling up the sufferings of Christ in my flesh. That's just like Christ was poured. Paul is saying, I'm being poured out for you Gentiles. And, and God gave him the grace to do it. Like in, look in chapter 3, Ephesians 3. He said in verse 8, he says, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. It's not spoken of in the Old Testament. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. I, I, I just wanted you to see a couple other things before we stop. Go to Psalm 104. Psalm 104 and take 1st Chronicles <laughs> and Lord willing we'll, we'll be done. Psalm 104 and 1st Chronicles chapter 11. In Psalm 104, read from verse 13 here. Psalm 104, verse 13. He says, He watereth the hills from His chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle, an herb for the service of man, that he may, that he may bring forth food out of the earth and wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. Wine that maketh glad the heart of man. It's like, in other words, see Paul's like the wine offering that was poured out for you Gentiles, whereby we rejoice and are glad and, and can say, oh, thank God my sins are paid for. Thank God I, I'm justified. I, I'm been reconciled to God by Jesus Christ, even though I was dead in trespasses and sins and without hope and without God in the world. A gladness, in other words, the receiving of that fact and that truth there, see? We could, there couldn't be that. The sacrifice wouldn't be complete, even though Christ had died, without the pouring out of that drink offering. How could you ever be happy? In fact, the reverends and the doctors and they don't want you to be happy about it. <laughs> you know, they want you to walk around with this big old burden all the time, you know. Confess, confess, and do and do and give and, you know. The last thing, look in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, uh, Chronicles, 1 Chronicles, sorry, 1 Chronicles 11, In 1 Chronicles 11, from verse 17, he says, And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem that is at the gate. And the three, these three men, the three break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. But David would not drink of it, but poured it out to the Lord and said, My God forbid it me that I should do this thing. Shall I drink the blood of these men that have put their lives in jeopardy? For with the jeopardy of their lives they brought it. Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mightiest. In other words, I'm just using that. To, it's like the, the jeopardy of his life. In other words, Paul poured it out that we might know that Christ died for us. 
Now, when you start getting the picture of all of that, and you begin to read about Paul saying that, my, he said, my sufferings for you is your glory. He's like, don't be sad about it. It's your glory. And he said, be you followers of me. And it starts putting things in, a, in perspective. Not just follow him in the sense of, you know, uh, get, argue with the, you know, the Baptist and the Methodist and whatever about Peter and Paul, you know. But in that humility and that, a bit, and that willingness to, to suffer reproach and on and on. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Our time is up. I appreciate you all being here tonight. And I uh, enjoy the, the, having the conversation.